about this session about solid state batteries. And uh, I'm Christine Edstrom. I will be moderator for this session. And we are I'm very happy that we have four. I think the fourth one is coming in. I've seen him today. Four speakers uh, that will tell us uh, with different perspectives on this uh, with, bat uh, with solid state batteries. Uh, in April this spring, there was a uh, roadmap on solid state batteries published by Fraunhofer, and we will he hear a discussion by that by Thomas Muls from Fraunhofer. We will hear about advanced materials for solid state batteries from Hikashi Kaga from Umicor. Uh, we will hear how it is to bring solid state uh, batteries uh, to an SME and how that SME is hopeful for the future by Fanny Bade from Solithor. And uh, then we, we our four speaker that I promise is here. Um, we talk about solid state battery breakthroughs in electrolytes. And he is from uh, Valerie Buzet from Solvay. Um, as you who are online, and uh, that's the reason why we start in time, you can hear a lot of noise perhaps. And that's because we just have had a coffee break, so many people are moving into the room. Uh, so I will allow a little bit of time for people to get seated before we really start uh, this session. So please take your seats, and I hope our fourth speaker will join us very, very shortly. Uh, he probably grabbed a cup of coffee. Uh, but while you are getting seated, there is a discussion. When will the solid state battery really come on the market? In one sense, you can say it is already in the market with the solid state batteries produced by Blue Car and have been on the streets in Paris since many years. But if we look at the new solutions for solid state batteries with uh, both ceramic uh, electrolytes and hybrid electrolytes, uh, there are hopes to gain even more uh, higher energy content in the solid states of the batteries. You online, you uh, don't realize this, but this seems to be a very popular session. So many people moving into the room <laughs> after the coffee break. And uh, I still allow a few seconds for people to find their, their seats uh, before we really, really start. That's the mismatch of having a thing online and having it in public. But it's such a nice thing that we who are here can meet and network again. So please take your seats so we can have a good start of this session. And could the organizers help me to find the fourth person who was in the our preparation room that we lost somewhere? We have a full audience here. I hope you are a full audience also online. So. Now it's starting to calm down. And uh, I hope that we now really, really can start this session. On oh, no. more. <laughs> wow, you are really a popular <laughs> panel. <laughs> Let's see if we have seats to everyone. I really apologize to you who are online. I want to ha this have, have this started sharply. <laughs> but uh, I hope we will not have too many. There are some seats in here, also in the front row. Don't be shy. Do we think that it's coming down now? You think so? So. Let this session begin. So most welcome. I will be the moderator. I'm Professor Christine Edstrom from Uppsala University. And I'm so proud to present our first speaker who will describe this roadmap on solid state batteries that were published, was published in April this spring. And it will be, be uh, given by uh, Thomas Schmultz, who you should see here on the stage. 
No? No, here you have. Now you are here. Please, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Maybe I take this microphone? Or? Yep. Okay. Then I have to stay close here to those microphones. I think that's okay. Perfect. So thank you very much, uh, Christina, and uh, thank you very much for the organizers um, for inviting me here um, to talk about uh, solid state batteries and um, yeah, the future of solid state batteries um, here today. And as Christina mentioned already, um, we have, have been working on a, a solid state battery roadmap study and we published a report in, in spring this year. Um, and um, yeah, in this document or in this study, we, we were looking at the current status um, globally of solid state batteries of the um, most important solid electrolytes and, and um, cell concepts and how it might develop in the next years, um, which applications there are and um, how the market could evolve. And um, yeah, I will give a short summary um, of the results today here. But before talking directly about solid state batteries, uh, we need to look at the, uh, at the bigger picture. Um, and that is um, the, the lithium ion batteries in general and the market development of, um, of lithium ion batteries. Because uh, the, the uh, liquid electrolyte lithium ion batteries are the benchmark technology for solid state batteries. And so um, we need to have a look at the bigger picture. And, um, we have developed a model um, on what we think how, how the market, how the global uh, demand of lithium ion batteries will develop in the next years. And uh, as you can see here in this, uh, in this graph, um, we believe that there will be um, a, a global demand of uh, three terawatt hours per year in 2030 and uh, close to six terawatt hours in 2040. So there is a a huge um, market growth in the next years um, and um, of course there are uh, quite some uncertainties um, at this moment because it depends strongly on political decisions such as for example the combustion engine out of the European Union. Uh, decisions like that of course fuel this demand further and um, yeah, depending on, on political decisions but also corporate uh, decisions. Um, yeah, um, we will see how it will actually grow, but it will grow significantly, and I think this is what we can all agree to. Um, but now we want to look more closely on the solid state batteries, and there it's much more difficult to, to make a forecast on the, on the numbers and how, how the market will grow. Um, we tried to do it anyways, and we asked um, experts from, uh, from R&D and from industry uh, what they think how fast the market will grow. Um, and I've written here on the slide um, some numbers that came out of this uh, little, little expert survey. Um, and those numbers are relatively uh, low. So they are in the, let's say, 1% to 2% range um, in, in uh, 2030, 2035. So in our opinion, um, it will not grow so quickly, although there are, of course, a lot of potentials. But now let's first look at uh, the, the numbers that are um, a, a bit clearer um, and a bit more um, um, determined. Um, and that is the, the publication numbers and the uh, patent application numbers on solid state batteries. So uh, as indicators for research and uh, IP generation and industrialization. And what we can see clearly is that the um, that the research um, increased um, significantly in the last years. So there is a lot of interest and a lot of R&D going on in the, in the field. Um, and um, what we can see that the European Union, here in, in blue on the slide, um, is, is also quite active and quite good uh, in R&D on solid state batteries. Um, we can also see that China recently really um, intensified their R&D efforts. Um, but yeah, um, and the US as well, but um, yeah, the European Union is, is not in a bad position here. 
When we look um, on the patent application numbers, um, this picture is a bit different. Um, so Japan is leading in this, um, followed by the US, and South Korea and China are also intensifying their efforts here. Um, but the European Union, you can see that the trend, uh, especially in the, in the last few years, is um, not, not so promising, I would say. I think we, uh, we would need to work a little bit on that. So why, what, what is actually a solid state battery? I haven't explained that so far. Um, well, this, the structure of a solid state uh, battery is very similar to a, to a classical lithium ion battery, um, but you just replace the liquid electrolyte with a solid uh, ionic conductor, <coughs> a, a solid electrolyte. Um, and um, yeah, but the, the other components, um, so cathode and anode, um, are, are similar materials typically, um, but it enables also the, the use of, of uh, a lithium metal anode, which um, is, is uh, very promising in terms of uh, KPI improvements. So in our study, we looked more closely at three different classes of materials, of solid electrolyte materials. And those are uh, oxide um, um, solid electrolytes, polymer solid electrolytes, and sulfide electrolytes. And um, here I want to present um, some of the most promising cell concepts, so how, how you could actually assemble a, a battery cell, a solid state battery cell, because there are many cathode active materials, many anode uh, active materials, and many solid electrolytes, so there is a, a, a wide range of possibilities how to actually um, build up a battery cell. So for the oxides, um, um, solid electrolytes, um, one of the most promising um, cell concepts is um, the one that, I, uh, that you can see here on the left side with a lithium metal anode, uh, an NS NMC-based uh, cathode and uh, oxide-based solid electrolyte. Um, the oxide-based electrolytes typically show a, a, a high chemical compatibility, a high mechanical uh, stability. Um, uh, that's why they can um, directly be combined with lithium metal anodes and, and NMC. Um, on the other hand, a drawback is that the uh, ionic conductivities are limited uh, for this material class, uh, and therefore at the moment uh, you will need on the, on the cathode side um, uh, a gel electrolyte as catholite um, because the ionic conductivities are just not high enough yet. Um, applications for, for uh, those oxide SSPs uh, will be in the, uh, in the electric uh, car market and we expect them to, to show up on the market somewhere between 2025 uh, and 2030. Um, Companies that are working on, on that are Prologium, QuantumScape, and, and Quintao, uh, amongst others. Um, let's look at the polymer solid state batteries. And uh, as Christina mentioned earlier, they are actually on the market already. Um, there are buses driving around with this type of, uh, of solid state battery. Um, and um, it's, it, it contains uh, lithium metal anodes. Uh, a PEO-based uh, solid polymer electrolyte and LFP cathodes. So the advantage of this, uh, of, of this cell concept is that it's already on the market, that it's potentially cheap. You can produce it by, uh, by extrusion uh, processing, so you don't need wet processing and, and long drying rooms. Um, so that are potential advantages, but drawback on the other side is that the ionic conductivity at room temperature is too low, so you need to heat the whole battery to 50 to 80 degrees that uh, it actually works. Um, nonetheless, they are on the, on the street already in buses, um, uh, also industrial applications and, and, solid, um, and, and stationary storage are envisaged, and also in the, in the medium to longer term cars. So companies that are working on that um, are amongst others Blue Solutions, um, uh, Gangfeng Lithium, um, We Lion, and uh, Hydro Quebec. 
Sulfide uh, solid electrolytes are also a very promising class of materials and, um, and the, the two most promising cell concepts um, involve both uh, NMC, cathode active materials. The ionic conductivity of, this, uh, of the sulfide electrolytes is good enough um, that you can use it uh, as, as catholite and as analyte um, if, if needed uh, in, in the case of um, of silicon uh, anodes. So the two uh, cell concepts differ just in the, in the anode material. In one case, it's a, a silicon carbon-based composite um, anode, and in the other case, uh, a lithium metal anode, which gives higher energy density, but uh, on the other hand, has the challenge of um, compatibility, because the sulfide electrolytes are typically not directly compatible with lithium metal anodes, so you need um, to, to, to have an interlayer in there. So um, for both um, cell concepts, the, the uh, application will be the, the car market, the automotive market. Um, and um, the time scale is, is, is similar compared to the oxide ones. So we also believe that they will be on the market somewhere in between 2025 and 2030. There are actually a lot of companies working on, on those cell concepts including Solid Power, CATL, LG, Panasonic, Samsung, SK Innovation, and uh, Toyota. So why are we actually looking at solid state batteries? Well, um, it's a growing market and the batteries, um, so there is a big driver for um, um, actually improving the batteries that we have. And uh, the liquid electrolyte lithium ion batteries have certain physical limits. So you cannot improve them further and further. Um, um, and, and therefore, um, one way to, to go further with, the, with the, um, the performances is actually to use the solid electrolytes. Um, because one important key parameter for the, especially for the automotive uh, application, for mobile applications, is um, the energy density. And with solid state batteries, it's possible to, to uh, achieve higher energy densities compared to liquid electrolyte uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, in this uh, uh, graphic, you, you can see that we've calculated different uh, energy densities, volumetric and gravimetric, for different cell concepts. Um, and uh, of course, we used certain assumptions, and they might not be entirely right, but it should g uh, give a certain uh, picture on which scale we, we might be able to reach, um, which range of, of energy densities. And um, you can see on the slide there is also at the bottom the, the reference to, to our study that is um, available online uh, free of charge. So if you are more interested in that, you can read on that as well. So another very important um, uh, key performance indicator, what we also heard this morning in the session, is uh, the safety of the battery cells. Um, and uh, at this stage, it's, um, it's still a bit hard to, to uh, specifically say the safety will be better or worse, because it's not entirely clear yet which materials will be in the, um, in, in the SSBs that come to market. Um, but uh, we have some indications um, that because of the absence of, of liquid uh, electrolytes, of this flammable organic liquid, the safety might be actually better, um, same as for uh, the long-term stability and the lifetime of the batteries. Um, because we think there might be less um, unwanted side reactions in this uh, entirely solid system compared to uh, a system that contains uh, actually a liquid. Um, fast charging ability is also for the automotive market interesting um, and uh, it is in principle possible for solid state batteries to be designed for fast charging um, but we have to keep in mind that it's not possible to improve all KPIs simultaneously. So you will not have a, a battery with the highest energy density possible that is also able to fast charge. So you need to have a certain compromise between those KPIs. And um, what we are seeing is also a diversification of, um, of the batteries that are on the market that are designed for specific purposes. Um, so 
could be a, a battery that is designed for fast charging and one for very high energy density. Last but not least, the price is very important and uh, it will most, most probably initially be higher because of lower um, volume manufacturing new processes that, that will be needed. So looking at the application, the, the big driver is the automotive market. Um, and um, yeah, that, that is also the main market where we see especially uh, uh, sulfide and oxide based uh, SSBs. Um, um, so that will be the main application. Uh, initially, especially the sulfide uh, SSBs could also come to the consumer market because the, the uh, testing requirements are just less stringent. Uh, in this market compared to the automotive market. And uh, of course, the, the polymer SSBs are on the market already. Um, we can see them in, in buses driving around um, and further applications are also envisaged there. Uh, the market itself, as I uh, initially said already, um, the, the ramp up will be, yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't say slow, but uh, compared to the overall um, uh, growth of the lithium-ion battery market, um, it will not reach high percentages of, uh, of market share in, in the next years, in our opinion, um, because it will be initially more expensive. It will require new processes of manufacturing, new materials involved. Um, so initially, it will, uh, it will be more, more costly. And therefore, we also see it uh, initially in the, in the high price segment in the, in the premium market. And with that, uh, I want to thank my, my colleagues um, that um, worked with me on, on this study together. Um, uh, so thank you very much for that. And uh, of course, my, my institute and uh, the funding agency, which was the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany. And last but not least, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Thomas. And uh, please save your questions, because we will take all the questions to this panel at the end of this session. So I will immediately move to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, from Yumikur, Sashi Kaga. It will be a pleasure to hear more about your advanced materials. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm Sashikaga. Uh, I'm coming from Imika. Especially, I'm a uh, director and the program director of uh, corporate r and within Imika. And actually, Imika within Imika, we have a different uh, program, like uh, let's say Horizon 1, 2, and 3. And basically, I'm responsible for Horizon 2 and Horizon 3. That's why I'm going to talk about advanced castle material for stress cell battery. Yeah, this is a kind of agenda. I'm going to talk about uh, six uh, kind of uh, topics. First, let me uh, talk about uh, broad chemistry of the material. Especially, we have a uh, high nickel material, also different type of material based on a liquid rich ammonium battery, but based on a solid cell battery. So, uh, briefly touch up on our portfolio within the uh, Imicoa. And also, I'd like to touch up on the solid cell battery development. Because Thomas already mentioned, maybe market will be like uh, beyond. Uh, between the 2028 or 2030, and then after 2030, we need to really focus on the uh, application of science. That's why we need to really align with OEM and the internal development. That's very important to talk about. And the next step is, what does that mean for cathode material for stress cell battery? Because we especially have a different uh, requirement that other than liquid rich ion battery, we need to really think about combination between the cathode and electrolyte material, meaning we're talking about cathode. Always interface between the cathode and the electrolyte is very important to further increase activity, also maybe a, a cycle life, that's very important. Then we talk about uh, breeding, breeding block within the micro because we have a different type of chemistry, coating, technology, morphology, and also uh, that's very important to combination of all those kind of stuff. That's what I will touch upon. Then uh, material development, very important because Again, as I mentioned, castrite is very important to understand interface between the cathode and electrolyte. I'm going to give some uh, example based on uh, nickel, NMC62, uh, or nickel 80% composition. 
And then also I'd like to touch up on the application side of sync because anyway, so based on the coin sale per cell doesn't work, you need to have like a, a large amount of like sale, like let's say one ampere, even like five ampere. That's very important to understand the potential of a solid state battery application. That's the main my agenda. Okay, this is a kind of roadmap. It's, I would say that two by two metrics. If you look at the uh, uh, short and mid term, and the mid term is the long term, this is like a time horizon. At, at the same time, if you look at uh, different aspect, like design to performance, also uh, design to cost, we have uh, two by two metrics. If you look at uh, uh, today, people really work on the nickel content of 60% or 80%. Beyond that, people are looking for more nickel content. That's a design to performance. Then also we are touching upon, not, not today, but uh, we are working on the silicon and material to further increase energy density. Our target is more than 300, maybe 400 watt hour per cage. That's a target for our material. And if you look at the cost to uh, uh, performance, and we have like a really manganese rich type of material we call HLM internally. High rich manganese material, we really have like a more than 60%, 70% manganese, while we can reduce cobalt content and nickel content because uh, currently market is very important, especially for metal price is very high. That's why we have different, different pathway. Then if you look at the uh, mid term and the long term, maybe especially for high nickel material, we are working on a special coating technology based on SSP material. That's a very important for us. That's the main topic today. And also, we are working on sulfite-based cathode, cathode material. That's beyond the 2030. But maybe it's quite you know, far away from the market today. Also, we are working on sodium ion battery application. Because you know, the lithium price is very important, and also picking up a lot. That's why, just in case, we're really working on sodium ion-based material. That's kind of a roadmap within the UMICOR. OK, this is a kind of a, uh, SSP development roadmap. And Thomas already mentioned, uh, especially the market size for SSB would be happened after 28 or 29. Also depends on what kind of storage cell battery you, you're talking about. If talking about semi-solid or polymer cell, semi -solid, that's already maybe start would be 26 or 27. That's why now we are r and phase, also qualification phase. So in the coming one year, two years, our material will be qualified by customer side, and then we can provide material after 25, 26. That's the timeline. But if you look at the solid uh, sulfide based application, R&D is still ongoing. Especially, corrugation will be taking place in 25, 26, and then we try to provide all material to uh, customer side after 27, 28. That's very well uh, aligned between our company, also OEM and the battery manufacturer. That's the kind of uh, timeline for solid state battery application. And uh, what is important, again, of course, cathode is very important to increase the activity, but also, as I mentioned, cathrite. Cathrite is meaning combination between a cathode and electrolyte is very important. I can touch up on that briefly. And also, uh, on June 22nd, we already made announcement. We collaborate with Edemis, who is a supplier of electrolyte material. We try to make a nice cathrite material to increase our, our activity. Then, also important thing is you need to talk to OEM. So we need to well align OEM because we need to talk the same language, what they speak. That's why we, we have a lot of collaboration with OEM, but in manufacturer to align, especially timeline and the method, that's really important to align, to understand, to further accelerate around the activity. Okay, this is a kind of a cathode development because if you look at the cathode material, you need to develop core technology, also coating technology. For core technology, you need to have like a, a doping, also that's very important, also morphology is very important. The primary particle size is very important to really understand or further reduce DCR. And if you look at the coating technology, so it depends on what kind of electrolyte material you can use. Based on the polymer cell, based on the sulfite, you need to have a special coating. Also, you need to really think about the thickness of coating, what different type of material. That's very important to understand. Because we have a lot of requirements from customer, especially OEM, if talking about high voltage application. We're talking about more than 4.35 or 4.4 voltage application. We need special coating. That's very important. Also, it like, uh, depends on the power cell, hard and uh, prismatic cell. Requirement completely different. We can play with the core technology, also uh, uh, coating technology, to apply all applications. Especially SSB is very important to apply coating technology. OK. Yeah, that's a kind of a breathing block within the uh, material. 
Okay, first you need to look at the cathode composition based on the nickel component, component 60%, 70%, 80%, even like 90%. That's a kind of portfolio. And then within the kind of chemistry, we have a different morphology, like a polycrystalline, uh, uh, monocrystalline, that's very important to combine with this kind of aspect. And on top, particle size is very important because people are asking us like a large particle size or even like a uh, bimodal particle size. Combination between the small particle size, large particle size, uh, make it happen to further increase energy density. On top, Coatings, again, very important based on the polymer cell oxidation, uh, oxide uh, process, also sulfide material. We, we complete different coating technology of coating material. So having a combination of NMC material, crystallinity, also particle size and coating, we can more than like 100, 100 species to provide a customer size. It's really kind of tailor-made you know, solution to customer size. And maybe one example would be, if you look at the uh, uh, light up the figure, that's based on the polymer type SSB, okay? If we don't have any coating technology on top of custom material, cyclide is really bad. But once having a specific coating only for polymer technology, you can further increase the cycle life. That's the situation right now. And then also I'd like to touch upon the sulfide based cathode material. If you look at the light bottom, that's based on the cathode material and also sulfide based material. And it's very difficult to see, but uh, anyway, so we have a very good uh, result based on uh, uh, solid state battery. Also, this is really compa compatible with the liquid based technology. So, our technology is quite good to reach, reach more than 200 million per program with the sulfide based material. That's kind of a portfolio we already developed internally. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of a testing application, as I mentioned, like to make a concert doesn't work. At least you have like a large cell format, maybe one of your cell to really understand characterization of material itself. And then on top, we have a really good technology, both on the material characterization and as well as cell application. That's very important. And uh, maybe we can touch, not uh, touch up on the in detail, but uh, at least combination of characterization and application side, you can really uh, extract performance from uh, all sorts of battery application, especially cathode point of view. That's very important for us. Okay, this is a kind of take, take uh, home the message. As I mentioned, First, you need to well align the OEM and what kind of requirements they're asking and what kind of electrolytes they use. And also, timeline is very important because cathode material is uh, it's, it's quite easy to adapt to the different particle size, morphology, and the coating technology. But at the same time, you need to think about really combination between the cathode and the electrolyte. It's called cathode. That's the key technology based on the sulfide material. That's very important to talk about. So that's why, based on the requirement from the customer side, we really have a building block internally to adapt this kind of tailor-made method to provide all material to the customer side. That's our target. And then I think this is the uh, last slide to give to you. And then so, uh, I can maybe uh, answer as much as possible during a panel discussion. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and again, remember your questions. And though, those of you who are online, you can already now write in your questions uh, so that we know how to proceed and what to ask later. But before the questions, I would like to welcome Fanny Badi to the stage. Last time I met you physically, you were at IMEC, the RTO here in Belgium. And somehow you must have made something interesting there because you are here to present an SME, a quite new SME on solid state batteries. So please. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So that's wonderful to be here today uh, with many of you attending this conference. Solitor is the company I would like to introduce you today. I'm very proud to be founder and CTO of Solitor. And today I will bring you uh, to our journey from research to market by means of startup creation. Oops. And where to better start than with our raison d'etre. Solitor is all about solid state rechargeable lithium metal battery. Solitor aim to commercialize the technology to power electric vehicles in the air, on land, and sea, and space. 
I think we all agree that the world needs a technology breakthrough in rechargeable lithium metal battery to power a range of vehicles in our day-to-day -day commerce. In collaboration with IMEC, and capitalizing on 10 years research at IMEC and patented nanosolid composite electrolyte, Solitor will continue the R&D and will produce an intrinsically safe lithium metal solid state battery. The target, of course, is to achieve higher energy density, far exceeding the capability of conventional battery. So Solitor falls under the category 4B, next generation cell technology, where actually we combine a solid state electrolyte together with lithium metal. The solid electrolyte will bring some safety to the system and will enable us actually to use lithium metal to replace the graphite used today at the anode. By the combination of these two materials, we can achieve lighter battery and greater energy density. So what is the unique selling point of Solitor, of our technology? First of all, this technology was patented at IMEC, the R&D center in Leuven. The nanosolid composite electrolyte is represented here. We have a picture of the material. It's a solid electrolyte, as we just say, with fast lithium ion uh, transport uh, properties. On top of that, the material presents some intrinsic safety. As I just mentioned earlier, the combination of the solid electrolyte together with the lithium will enable us to get higher energy density. Also, the material performs well in a broad temperature range. One of the key points of our material is that you start from liquid precursor before to have a solid material. And this brings a lot of advantage if you think about manufacturability. Indeed, you can reuse some part of the cell production line used today on the cathode side, impregnate your liquid precursor into the cathode, and the material solidify in situ, so it's a kind of drop-in solution for the solid electrolyte, which is very different from other type of our competitor solid electrolyte where the cathode, for example, process needs to be completely uh, revised. Last but not least, uh, we will produce sustainable battery materials and sustainable battery cells. For example, we are not planning to use costly rare earth element like germanium, which is used in certain competitor technology. We don't need a high temperature treatment, which is the case, for example, in oxide, where you need to heat the material up to 800 degrees to form oxide. We don't have this high temperature process. And on the longer term, on the technology roadmap, we want to minimize the use of solvent during the production of the cells and to reduce the amount of cobalt. Now I would like to explain you the trajectory of Solitor from radical innovation component towards the market by means of the startup creation. So let me first turn back the clock to 2014, where a team in IMEC discovered a new material, the nano-solid composite electrolyte, with very nice conductivity, 1 to 10 millisiemens per centimeter at room temperature, a material stable up to 320 degrees. After having uh, demonstrated the process and uh, built and assembled the first uh, coin cell, uh, this happened during the period 2016 to 2018. And now we come to 2019, actually the most interesting part of the project and the trajectory. And that's actually at that time when I joined IMEC as a program manager for Solid State Battery Program. We uh, defend the case internally. We follow the innovation track within IMEC, where we attend and present to the innovation call. We made an arrangement pitch. And very soon after that, we were very successful. We get a venture time box, which allow us to build a stronger case around the technology to look at what type of market we would like to address. And actually, in 2021, I pitched to, to the VC venture capital for the first time. And actually, it was very successful. The technology was very well welcome. They were ready to invest. But if you would talk to any VC, they will tell you that the key ingredient for startup is a team. And at that time, we had no team. So if you allow me, I will give you some insight of the role I play within Solitor. At that time in my life, I get that once in a lifetime opportunity to, to think to myself, after 20 years of battery research, probably that's the moment for me to make the jump and create something very special. 
So at that time, indeed, I decided to join the, the company, found the company. My first step there was actually to find a, a partner, a co-founder, Mr. Hugh Hampson jones now the, CT, the CEO of the company, and together we found the company in September of last year. So by the way, this conference is almost at one year the, the birthday of Solito, so I'm very happy to be here to celebrate our first birthday of the company. And after that, things were very fast, time fly. In the last 12 months, we raised 10 million capital. We start building our team of experts to further develop the technology. And officially, the company is starting operations since 1st February this year. So I think we can uh, agree that there is different ingredients for a startup to, 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 to start uh, happening, let's say. So the first contributor to success, of course, is the technology. But only with the technology, you are not there. You also need a, a strong multinational team of experts, which we start to build, as I say. And of course, we have our investors. Today, we have five investors in, in Solitor, four capital investors, which are IMEC Expand, which is the venture branch of IMEC. The second investor is LRM um, and NUMA. So these two are from the Limburg region. And also, we have FPIM, which is the uh, Belgium sovereign fund for investment. And last but not least, we also have a fifth investor, IMEC, with whom actually, which is contributing in kind to Solitor in exchange for exclusive license on the patent portfolio that they developed over the last years. So where are we today? I think we can say that we have an exponential growth over the last few months. Uh, we raised 10 million for the seed round. Uh, we are building uh, our technology on a patent portfolio of more than 14 patent family uh, and applications, which were developed at IMEC. We have a management team uh, with more than 35 years cumulated experience in relevant battery and automotive industry. As I say, we already hired 10 PhD with expertise in material science, material engineering, and battery engineering. Of course, we are back up we, by the team of IMEC. We are still today working daily with the team of IMEC uh, to bring the technology further. And if you want to find us today, we are, our headquarters is in Energyville. It's in Genk, in the Limburg region. Uh, we are at the moment uh, using this infrastructure to start uh, uh, upscaling the technology. And of course, we also have a visionary business plan uh, and the technology roadmap, which has been validated by experts. So Solitaire's ambition, of course, it's to, um, to grow and to uh, establish very soon a research center for excellence for solid state battery in Europe. Um, with our unique product value proposition, we would like to strengthen the battery value chain. And if you look on the schematic, where will we be active? We want to be active in the solid state component production, because of course these are the core of our technology. We would like to be, uh, become a solid state cell manufacturer and also to produce modules with the cells. And of course, for everything which is happening at the beginning of the value chain and after, uh, after the module production, we are really seeking for collaboration and partnership. We believe this is very important to build from day one a very strong partnership, for example, with uh, active material supplier, cathode active material suppliers, or, uh, or on the other hand, with end user, with, uh, with whom we have to discuss almost on a daily basis to really understand the requirement of the cell. As Thomas said, you can design cells with different performance, and uh, as soon, the, the sooner we know that, the better. And finally, on the longer term, of course, we would like to establish a secure and sustainable supply for rechargeable battery system uh, for Europe. Last point, Solitor Sustainable Solid State Battery, therefore, uh, will contribute to a, um, a sustainable world in three main areas. First of all, the environmental sustainability. Second, the economical sustainability of Europe, but also the societal sustainability. On the first point, as I already mentioned, we plan to use um, materials which are sustainable, um, but also indirectly, uh, when our battery will be used into product, they will help to reduce CO2 emission and uh, find particle emission in the atmosphere. On top of that, we all know that electric uh, vehicles uh, produce less noise, which is better for every citizen. On the second point, from an economic, economical point of view, we want to strengthen the battery value chain. 
and we want to create and be part to secure a sustainable supply of battery for Europe. I think we have seen over the last month that indeed, from a geopolitical point of view, it's, it's important to start to create some level of independence. Finally, the societal, societal sustainability, sorry, we, are, uh, we want to develop a highly skilled uh, uh, workforce in Europe. And as, as I think we can already say, we have been creating a lot of jobs so far, and we will continue to do so. So if you are passionate about science, I want to put uh, the science into a real product to the market, please join us. You are very welcome. And with that, I would like to thank you. It has been a great pleasure to be here today. And um, thank you very much. Well, congratulations to your birthday. <laughs> Great that we all can celebrate it with you. We have also a full speaker who will be online presenting uh, solid state battery electrolytes. And I hope uh, that uh, we can find you, Valerik Buzet from Solvay online. Yes. Can you hear me well? You are here? Great. I leave the floor to the. Um, the organizers to help you through these uh, the slides, please. We hear you well. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. So, my name is Valérie Busset. I'm a head of uh, the solid state battery development at Solvay. Uh, Solvay is a um, worldwide chemical company serving the battery industry for more than 20 years uh, with specialty polymers like PVDF and electrolyte ingredients. As discussed in the previous presentations, the, the current generation of lithium ion batteries are now well optimized. And if we want to move further, we need breakthrough um, in different kind of options like autonomy, fast charging, cost control, and more sustainable processes. And in that field, solid state batteries are expected to play a major role. Um, there are many challenges to be overcome. Uh, from the material choice to cell design, and among them, electrolyte ingredients, as was already emphasized, which are, which are fully new for some of them, will have a key role in enabling this new technology to emerge. If you can go to the next slide, please. Yes, thanks. Um, so, indeed, more performant battery designs uh, need breakthrough in the development of electrolyte ingredients. So moving from Gen 2 to Gen 3 batteries is already a move in, a, I would say, um, new additives in the electrolyte formulation or better improved binders to enable the, to really enable the, the use of a better cathode, better anode, etc. For solid state battery, this is another gap. The aim is to target energy density in the range of 300 to 500 water per kg. <clears throat> And several designs are envisaged, but most of them require major innovation in ionic conductors and polymers. Considering these challenges, uh, we see, uh, I would say, the rise in EV markets in uh, 27 to 28, as was already said. Um, and yet, as uh, the challenge is so high, that might be intermediate generation that can be so-called solid, semi-solid battery that can emerge to bridge the gap in terms of performance and timing. If you go to the next slide, if, we, if you can go to the next slide, please. If we can, if we can go slightly deeper in terms of uh, the, the concepts, uh, it's a very simplified way. We can, I would say, categorize into options, so solid polymers and ceramic-based solid-state batteries. All of them uh, will provide uh, types of electrolytes uh, that should be, uh, I would say, non-liquid and non-flammable that are supposed to bring intrinsic safety and then more compact designs and enabling new anodes. And specifically, we spoke already about the, the use, the potential use of lithium metal anode that can be a game changer in energy density. Um, for solid polymer electrolytes options, there is a need of specific polymer design. There is also specific lithium salts to be used that are non-conventional ones and specific processes. In the second case, uh, the, the most popular ceramic-based electrolytes are based on oxidic and sulfidic electrolytes. 
They have different kind of components of performance. The oxides have lower electronic conduct ionic conductivity, but are supposed to be much stable to lithium metal, whereas the sulfidic electrolytes are said to be the only one to have high enough lithium conductivity to be envisaged in, in cathode application. Anyway, these uh, different options do not provide the same compromise of performance or the same processability challenges. Yet, proof of concept has been achieved in different, uh, on both sides, and uh, especially they are being actively developed by several known startups in the field. Yet, in the last uh, few months, or in the last six months, there, is, there have been several communications from uh, major cell maker and OEMs that tend to position the ceramic-based solid-state designs with sulfidic electrolyte on their mid to long-term roadmap. If you go to the next slide, please. To make this happen, to make this new generation happen on the market before 2030, there is a need to provide ele these electrolytes at scale, at reliable, at reliable quality and at cost in the coming years. And for this purpose, I see three pillars. The first of all, the first one is chemistries. So there is a need to define high performance electrolytes combining high lithium conductivity and control processability. I think the high lithium conductivity has been achieved at LAM, and uh, it's already the proof of concept is not to be demonstrated. What is more complicated probably today is to switch to I would say control processability parameters of the powder, or you can use the powder efficiently either in the densified layer, that's for the oxides, or in the composite system with binders, uh, which is more envisaged for sulfides, that can come through the control of the particle size distribution of the surface chemistry and also the use of this electrolyte outside of the glove box, but go in a dry rooms environments. Beyond the active material itself, there is also how you process it. So if you imagine to process it with, a, I would say, a, either wet casting with a binder or dry processes, current binder solution cannot be used and needs to be adapted to the solid electrolyte in terms, uh, for example, in terms of solvent choice or processes. So this requires also development of new chemistries and new processes. Beyond the first pillar on innovating chemistry, there is a high challenge in terms of production. The challenge here is to, to be able to have pilot assets at at least a ton level to be able to produce these electrolytes at relevant scale uh, so that uh, cell maker can work on the cell process definition and safety tests. What we, what we, what we know is that uh, I would say relevant safety tests can cannot be really envisaged uh, below 20 ampere hour sales design. So we need uh, significant quantities of products of electrolytes and processes at reliable quality so that we can envisage to have the full proof of concept at, at large scale. And beyond this, I would say, uh, pilot development, there is a need of uh, anticipation of industrial implementation in Europe that should be synchronized with uh, uh, cell makers and OEM all along the value chain. And finally, sustainability should be envisaged at the core value of any new developments from the lab to the industrial level. So the industrial part is a, is a, is a great challenge, but also a great opportunity for the implementation in Europe. And the third pillar for me is collaboration. Uh, we need a strong, uh, and we are building a strong R&D ecosystem in Europe both on chemistries, processes, and designs. We need also collaboration along all the value chain, uh, from raw material and chemicals to battery cell, manufacturing tools, OEMs, and recycling options uh, to make this as a success. And the financial support from EPCEI to secure the breakthrough project uh, is uh, really mandatory to, uh, to help all the value chain to succeed. If you go to the next slide, can be my uh, final slide. Uh, as an example of uh, what can be done, um, among other initiatives, ACC, SAFT, MAN, Siemens, Solvay, Yumi, Corbuller, and AMAT have built the European Alliance for Battery to accelerate the development of uh, solid state battery. And this is a good example of uh, how we can collaborate in, in, in the way to, 
to succeed and to implement a European battery value chain on this new technology. And last point, uh, I'm sorry not to be here with you, um, but the fact is that uh, Solvay is proud to announce that uh, we will start uh, a, a electrolyte uh, sulfate, sulfate pallet production uh, this week in France, which is a, a good uh, achievement with the support of the IPCI. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, <coughs> Valérie, and thank you all speakers. I think we now can start a question uh, and discussion. And uh, you, are, you who are online, you are welcome to write your questions. I will pick them up here. So, uh, but I will, and of course the audience here in the room, the huge audience we have, we, you must also have questions. But I will start myself. I will start where, where you were, Thomas, and you are also touching upon it, Valerie. And that is, you said in your roadmap that uh, Europe is quite weak. We are not really performing the way we should in this area. Is, is that, do I interpret it correctly? while Valerie Moore talked about the need to really collaborate in Europe. So what is your take on this? And I, I like your comments from, from, uh, also uh, from the panel. Well, I, th I think the, the research base uh, in Europe is not bad, actually. Um, we have a lot of good uh, people, like you, for example, uh, <laughs> who are good in academic research and producing very interesting and good results. Um, but I think in Europe, um, what, what we need to work on a bit more is to, to, to bring those results then finally on the market. So mm -hmm. to create IP, not only publish publications, but create IP, uh, make patents and start companies. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we, we should follow a bit more the example of Funny, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Would, you, would you like to follow up on that, please? I think, uh, I, think I agree with the, the comment that uh, research is very developed in Europe. Mm. I've been myself in a, a large car industry for 15 years, and I think the gap between the, the end user and, and the academia was a long time uh, not bridged. And I think indeed there should be more initiative in Europe to actually bring the technology to the market. And I think startup is one way. I think other big companies are also having a different approach, which I think are also very welcome to, to, to bridge that gap. Yeah, how are you looking at Umicore at this bridging? As, as yes, so indeed, especially if you look at the R&D ecosystem, Europe will be really in a good advantage, but if you look at the application size to make a large settlement, we need to really step up next level, because meaning industrialization is not enough, especially in Europe. So that's maybe a bridge between industrialization and academia is very important to uh, bridge the gap. That's very important, I think. I, I have a personal feeling uh, when looking at this as a scientist and you try to go and make a patent and you contact an innovation office and they are helping you. Know, and that the Asians and uh, particularly, but also the US, they're very good at putting a lot of, um, like, it's a, like a bomb mat of patents to really find your own little niche. It's not so simple. I don't know if, if <laughs> you agree to that picture. <laughs> it is sort of overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, there are different ways also to look at patent applications. Actually, there are different strategies to apply patents, mm. which might be different in, in Europe, US, and Japan, or uh, Asia, let's say. Mm. Okay, so that's something for collaboration. Uh, what's your take, Valerie, on this when you are listening to this panel discussion? I think I agree that the challenge is to move from, I would say, a strong uh, research ecosystem to industrialization, so overall bridging, bridging this, uh, this gap that may be happening and being ready to, to be fast in uh, industrialization and have the support from the academic ecosystem also to this industrialization phase. Hmm. Thank you. I see if there are any questions from the floor and uh, the hands are jumping up in the air. Uh, I'd, I might even be quick here and, and um, please. My name is Olivier Collard from Blue Solutions. So Blue Solution is a battery manufacturer in France working on solid state batteries, so polymer solid state battery, as you, as you said already, uh, Christina. I would like to, to thank the Foreign Affairs Institute for uh, their report on SSB. It's a very, very interesting, that's a Bible <laughs> for all of us, I guess. 
Uh, just a comment. Uh, you say that uh, SS Polymer SSB is uh, available, but it seems, uh, according to what you said, that's a little bit the past, so there's no future. Uh, because, uh, as you explained, uh, we need to be heated at uh, 80 degrees to be available to, for the ionic connectivity. I just would like to say that uh, uh, within Blue Solution, but I guess with uh, other organizations, uh, we plan to have uh, this uh, SSB uh, polymer battery available uh, within uh, five years at uh, room temperature. So that's also the future, and for cars also, that's also the future for a solid state battery. And uh, it seems also to us that it uh, could be cheaper and uh, in terms of our industrial process, easier also. So you have more of a statement than uh, a question that uh, the problem is that with good room temperature performance will come. But here I hope for a question. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Hi, it's Steve Vallis from Dasso System. Um, how are the panel finding uh, constraints and supply constraints impacting on your ability to, to run R&D um, and actually test and innovate? And if, if you are, are you looking more into uh, sort of in silico approaches and simulation and modeling to make the most of the product you can get to innovate with? Did you get the question? Okay, yeah. uh, are, are you finding any issues with supply constraints to be able to innovate in a lab? And, and are you using any alternative sort of solutions in terms of simulation and in silico testing to innovate with? I think indeed when we have new material and we want to produce new material, we, make sh we have to make sure we can get uh, some supply. And that's where partnership is super important from the, the day one because, yeah, Obviously, as, uh, as was said by Valérie, you need to uh, increase the capacity of the cell, so you are quickly needing to upscale the materials. So f I would say the sooner you start your partnership with the suppliers of raw material, the better. Um, and in, in general, a comment um, that for the sulfide solid electrolytes, um, there is a little bit... Um, well, a shortage of large-scale materials available in Europe. So especially lithium sulfide, um, you cannot just buy in the ton scale uh, at the moment. So this definitely needs to be upscaled. Valerie, do we have any supply chain issues when you're looking at scaling up at Solvay? Uh, yes, as, as it was mentioned, so for, for the sulfide, there is a the management of uh, key raw materials that needs to be integrated in the development of the electrolytes, so that needs to be also industrialized at large scale. And maybe to, to answer to the other question on the modeling, uh, I would say modeling is a key part of the, the development of uh, our new new concept and new materials, so it's, uh, we, we, we also leverage uh, quite uh, deeply the, the modeling to, to innovate. Okay, especially for supply chain management in Europe. So, especially talking about sulfide based and electrolyzed material, you need to think about both precursor labeled the final product. Especially precursor uh, starting from lithium sulfide, we don't have any source resources now. Then also, we need to think about the last number of final uh, formation. That's very important. But both things uh, we are a lot of missing in Europe. That's what we need to step up. Otherwise, it's really difficult to penetrate the market in Europe. Mm. Thank you. Interesting question. And this question about how, how sort of the uh, method development is, is sort of this solid state. I'm reading now from, um, from uh, one of the questions from the audience that we don't see. Uh, which four factor will play a more important role in the development of nickel-rich NMCs? Morphology or structure coating? That's a typical question for Yes, uh, I think the question is regarding the morphology and so nickel yeah. content. Also, uh, if they're talking about sulfide-based material, this, again, this is a request from customer size. If you think about castle material and you need to combine the electrolyte material, then the FDL material might be different composition. So we need to really tailor-made between the two materials. So this takes time. But there's not only one solution. At least, I think a variety of solutions depends on nickel content coating also sulfide material. That's the situation right now. That's why we have a variety of uh, portfolio within mm -hmm. to apply those kind of requests from customer side. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but speaking again about the method development, I mean, you touched upon it in your question. And looking at an SME, and, and we say the big companies, they do modeling all the time. They try to integrate experiment, experiment and modeling in a loop and, and try to make that work. And that's also what we try to make the researchers do to not increase the gap between industry and research even more. How are you handling that when you're a few people? Can you really take the benefit of accelerating what you do compared to the old trial and error lithium-ion battery chemistry development? Yeah, I think we, we are uh, much more, I would say, than in classical academia, uh, relying a lot on planning of experiment and fail fast ap approach. Mm. That you have to try uh, several uh, different combinations and uh, very soon decide uh, if one path is the right one or not. So the fail fast approach is really something we have to, to implement, and it's a complete switch in mind uh, for researchers also to, to adapt to that way of working. So. Thank you so much. Do you, any one of you comment more on this? Otherwise, I have another question from our audience online. What is the biggest challenge in developing new electrolytes for solid state batteries? Cost, scalability, or quality? Who would like to answer? <laughs> you can uh, answer. Uh, actually, I'm not a specialist for electrolyte material, but anyways, as I mentioned, castrite is very important, combination of cathode electrolyte, and uh, how we uh, find a good matching between the two materials. So maybe interface is very important. But uh, for electrolyte material, they develop it yourself, maybe better to ask uh, uh, people from Sorbet. Yeah. Yes, Valerie, you, you <laughs> this question was thrown to you. What do you think? <laughs> Cost, scalability, or quality? <laughs> Yeah, and in terms of quality, as it was mentioned, uh, the key point is to match with other components of the cell. So this is a key point, and to match, I would say, large-scale processes. So there is uh, two, two key points on the quality, which, to my sense, are not solved, uh, solved yet and needs to, to, to be solved. And then, of course, the, the scalability, not the scalability, but investing in large-scale assets in Europe is a, is a challenge uh, also, uh, I would say, as a second order. But today, we are still at, uh, I would say, optimizing the, the best system, overall system uh, in terms of process and uh, interfaces. OK. I open for the audience. Yeah, hi there. Uh, Aidan Crohn, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Uh, last week, the Financial Times uh, had an article saying that that we, can, uh, we should dampen our expectations on the arri arrival of solid-state uh, lithium batteries. When, I mean, I know it's only a thumbstock, when do you expect to be able to deliver uh, our, uh, on mainstream in terms of, of, of solid-state? Well, it depends a bit on what you mean with mainstream. Um, so we expect it in the in the premium market, so that you can actually go to uh, to your uh, I don't know maybe Porsche dealer and and buy it in a car uh, before 2030. Uh, this we expect, uh, yes. But um, if you're talking about um, if you uh, when you will find it in a Fiat Cinquecento, um, this I think will be um, um, further down the future <laughs> roadmap. So uh, I I think it will take quite some time. Um, until the, the solid state batteries are um, on the automotive market are cheap enough to compete actually um, with, um, with the liquid electrolyte versions so that they will really go to the mass market. That's our expectation or, or what we think. Well, Valerie, what's your take on this? Do we have too high expectations? Should we try to... Um, time to market is still a, a debate. I, I think the 2030 horizon is... Okay. <laughs> but, uh, Fanny, you must have hopes. You have an SME. You have a vision that you should really push this now. Yes, I think uh, you will understand that at this stage it's very difficult to give a, a very precise date, so I will not do that. Uh, but I think we can all agree that there are many steps 
at least for us, where we are here today, uh, we are at small pouch cells levels. We need to go all the way to increase capacity, further confirm performance, uh, compatibility with different materials, uh, make sure that we can align. So there will be there is a lot of work for us to do, and I would say before 2030, I don't expect uh, our battery will be available. Okay, you Mikol, do you hope for more? I don't mean so to. basically, I really agree with Thomas because if you look at the customer side, and we have a very strong customer traction, and then they're talking about uh, SOP, like the start of operation would be 28, 29. That's really focused on the high end and high premium market. That's the starting point. But after 2035, maybe we have some point of like a, a, a mass market. Of course, at the time, I hope like a, a cost of break right might be much cheaper what we are up today. So that's kind of the consensus within like a battery space. Thank you. So the answer to your question is yes and no. <laughs> Porsche, yes, but the car for me as an academic, no. <laughs> um. uh, I'm uh, Dari Nikolaeva from Donaldson Filtration Solutions for Industry. And we are interested in actually off-road and heavy-duty uh, cars, transport, like long-haul trucks, mining equipment, tractors, do you, because do you see any possibility for this battery in these applications? Because what we are looking at, high energy densities, longer distances, at lower weight of the battery, because this is what affects our applications. Is there any date these batteries are going to start for this kind of uh, equipment? Um, well, I guess you need to talk to the companies that, uh, that will start to produce those batteries and uh, make a business case out of it. And then it might be actually uh, that this market um, can be successful. Um, but I, I think at the moment the main driver is just the automotive market, um, because those are the biggest numbers currently. And, um, and uh, the, the investors are also often coming from the automotive side. But in principle, um, I, I think that could be an interesting market uh, as well. But do you have any comments on Scania starting a truck with a lithium-ion battery last year for long-haul uh, trucking in Europe? So they have a distance of 250 kilometers on the normal lithium-ion and considering your energy density, they could produce a truck which is more interesting for continental transport, for example. Do you have considered this in your report or any other studies you're conducting? Um, yes, it, um, I, I agree. It is uh, definitely more interesting, but you... There are just different different business cases. So, so either you can design the, the battery to, to uh, that you can really drive 500 kilometers, but then you have you have to think about is is that really what the customer needs, or would they rather need a truck that you can recharge quickly, um, and that uh, goes um, goes less long. So. I, I think here it's again very important that the different sectors, the different uh, people in the value chain talk to each other. What do you actually need for this specific application and what can the battery deliver? And as I said before, I think we will see a diversification of the battery, battery industry. And there will be batteries that will be designed for trucks. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, and there will be batteries that will be designed for um, for our small cars that we are driving around with, and that they will not look identical, most probably. But um, at the moment, the, um, the biggest cost reductions that are coming are because of the upscaling of the automotive batteries. So um, this we also need to bear in mind, um, that the cost also always depends a bit on, on that, on, on the scale in which um, the batteries are being produced. 
And also, I'd like to one comment because if you're talking about trucks and heavy duty, because the cost is important. Cost means dollar per kilowatt hour. That's quite difficult to pay for the moment. That's why we're talking about the solar cell battery for premium brands. Still, they have absorbed this kind of high cost energy. That's very important. That's why so maybe market will be like a, uh, after 20, maybe 35 or 40, 40 years, because anyway, we need to further reduce the cost to adapt heavy duty in the trucks, especially for solar cell battery. I think I would like to add that uh, on a broader uh, range, uh, aviation sector, generally speaking, is also desperately looking for uh, solutions for, uh, let's say, conversion to electric aviation or hybrid aviation. So that's one over market where actually the cost uh, constraint might be less of a problem, I would say, than maybe for car industry. Uh, and another uh, type of uh, application we can thought of as an initiate market for solid state battery might be also submarine and this kind of application where, again, the cost uh, structure and the cost constraint are much less than on automotive. Mm -hmm. I, I will let first a uh, question from, the, um, from our digital... <laughs> present but not visible friends. We have a question perfect for you, Valerie. What is the, your bet, oxides, polymer, or sulfide? <laughs> this is a difficult question. And, uh, and maybe today we see that uh, only one choice, probably it will be a segmentation of the application. As what already been said, there is a compromise of performance, which is not the same uh, depending on these three technologies. So I would say that there is some room for uh, each of them, depending on the uh, specific uh, application targeted. Uh, yet, uh, the, the recent announcement, what I can say is that the recent announcement from us famous cell maker and OEMs tend to position uh, sulfidic ceramic-based solid-state battery on their own map, which is, uh, I would say, quite uh, new in 2010-22 uh, and maybe more precise. So. I would say this is also an indication that this specific technology has a future in a in EV application. Thomas, this is a question for you too, I think, with your own map. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, uh, uh, looking at the companies that are working on it, um, uh, I think I showed on my slide for the sulfide um, cell concepts a lot of large uh, um, big cell makers of battery cells. So um, to me, this is an indication that the that the big guys, so to say, are working on the sulfides. Uh, is kind of an indication that there might be a future there. Um, but I also uh, ag agree to Valerie that um, I think we will see all of them. Um, but maybe the the largest potential. I personally think might be in the sulfides. But also we shouldn't think in boxes. We always like to think in, in boxes, but I think there will be mixed concepts. Um, because I think you you will use the oxide materials um, because of their high chemical stability um, as interlayers, as coatings. Um, the sulfides are very good for um, their high ionic conductivity. So they might be used in other concepts as, as catholite material, for example. Uh, so I, I think there, there will be a, a big variety of, uh, of, of hybrid systems as well. And what would you think? Do you know a lot about the cathode? And you just mentioned how important the interface to yes, the electrolyte. Indeed. What yes. is your dream electrolyte? Of course, it depends on the market. It depends on the region. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Japan and North America, they really focus on sulfide based electrolyte material, for sure. But at the same time, it depends on the market size, the people looking for oxide. So anyway, so there's a lot of dependent application size. But I would say main drive would be based on the sulfide. That's if you look at the, uh, OEM and also battery manufacturer, they are really looking for sulfide based material for the moment. But uh, we don't know this is a kind of winner technology or not. So we need to still wait until maybe 2030. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we have a question from the audience. We waited long for asking this question. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sammy from uh, Bow Tree Cycling. We are a technology provider for uh, yeah, recycling. And uh, yeah, probably this question is uh, too early for today uh, mm -hmm. because um, well, for the liquid um, electrolyte, we actually nobody has a real good solution for recycling. 
And uh, since you are developing a new, uh, new um, battery, is the recycling aspect in the consideration of your research nowadays? Probably you won't, uh, you won't be worried about this problem for another 10 years, but uh, probably in 20 years. <laughs> I, I think the question is extremely relevant. Please, Fanny, you, I know you. <laughs> Thank you for this question. In, in, indeed, it's a very important aspect uh, when we design the new system that we, as soon as possible, uh, take into consideration the, the sustainability uh, and the recyclability of the materials. At the moment, what I can say is that for our company, we are looking at the component level, material level how uh, these materials are, let's say, um, bending or not, or hazardous to the environment. And of course, we have on our technology roadmap, uh, at some point when we will have a larger demonstrator, we would like to collaborate again to assess the, the recyclability of our battery on real uh, samples and real testing. So this is, of course, something which we are planning uh, on, on midterm uh, for our company. And Valerie, how is it with recycling in your case? Are you thinking of it now when you're announcing the new electrolyte? Yes, yes, of course. So, uh, Solvay is already engaged in, uh, in partnership in recycling of uh, current uh, generation of batteries. And for any new developments, in, including new electrolytes, of course, uh, recyclability is part of the, the design of the electrolyte itself. Yet, I would say that if we want to think to uh, recyclability as a whole of the of the cell and up to the back, then collaboration there can be a, a, a key point so that we can have a, a sustainable recycling uh, loop uh, in Europe. And especially I'm coming from Yumiko, I'm a specialist for cathodes and battery. I'm sure our colleagues at the Hobo can really looking for the battery recycling based on the sulfide material. That's for sure. Uh, that's already starting. Uh. It's part of your business model. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> you would like to do the recycling for it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so um, maybe a comment from my side as well. Um, I think it depends on the solid state battery technology that you're looking at. Uh, I think for the, for the polymer ones, uh, the recycling processes that we have right now, uh, or at least some of them, uh, should be suitable as well, because there are, in principle, n not really new materials uh, in there. Of course, the, the polymer electrolyte, but this um, can, can be treated similarly to the, to the liquid electrolyte in the recycling process. Um, for the sulfides, it's a bit more complicated um, because most recycling processes um, are looking at hydrometallurgical uh, processes in, uh, in, in the later steps of the recycling, and there the, the sulfide um, could create uh, certain problems. So the, the chemistry uh, of the hydrometallurgical process will need to be adapted um, to, uh, to sulfide electrolytes. More research, long-term research also on recycling, is what I hear from you. <laughs> also considering this. Okay, from the on online questions, uh, what would give investors more confidence to invest in startups and more generally for solid-state batteries, especially with this uh, article sort of damping our sort of expectations that came two days ago. What would you need, Fanny? <laughs> I think when we talk to investors, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the team is very important. I mean, the, there are three main components. The team is important, the technology, of course, and what's your... Um, your relation to the value chain. Honestly, they are really asking, uh, okay, do you have already contact uh, with uh, key supply, uh, suppliers? How will you provide uh, the material? Are you sure you can produce enough? So these are questions the investors are asking uh, very often. And on top of that, I think you have to, as a startup at least, to be um, as much as possible uh, Realistic, so of course you have to, to have some prospect, but realistic in your approach. You have to, for example, one choice we made at the moment is to uh, uh, leverage on the facility which is already there, because um, for a startup it's uh, difficult, I would say, to start building a, a full lab. But So now in the first stage we leverage on uh, uh, the battery laboratory in Energyville. Our team is there working hand in hand with HIMEC. And on the midterm, we are planning to have our own facility. But I think this step approach 
is something which gives confidence to the investors to, uh, to invest in startup because they realize the, that we take it one step at a time. You mm. cannot run before you, you walk. So. Good answer. Valerie, do you have any take on this? No, not specific. Not specific to it. No, I think this is really a question for funny, this with SMEs. And yeah. So anyone else from the audience? We have here um, Frederic. Hello, good morning, everyone. Frederic, I guess, from uh, CDTech Energy Storage. So we, when we talk about solid state battery, we are often referring to Generation 4B with lithium metal. What about the future of Generation 4A? Yeah, the role. Did you consider that in your roadmap? Um, so sorry, the, the, the 4A is without the lithium metal? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, on, on one of my slides, I had this, uh, uh, this sulfide uh, uh, SSB with a, with a silicon anode. And I think that is um, also a very interesting cell concept. Um, but let's say for the for the oxide and the polymer uh, SSB, um, I think there is not really an advantage of using silicon um, anodes because they are they are they show a quite good compatibility with the with the lithium anode, and that is kind of the 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 highest energy density that you can get with the lithium anode. Of course, there are certain stability concerns as well and challenges that need to be solved, um, and for that. The silicon anodes might be also interesting, yes. Um, but I think in the longer term, w one of the main advantages of moving to solid electrolytes is that you can actually use the, the lithium anode. Valerie, do you consider generation 4A at all in your, uh, your design of the electrolytes at Solvay? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, I fully agree with what it was, was said. In fact, the, the, the silicon anodes is, uh, is gaining popularity as a I would say, intermediate or promising solution for sulfide-based electrolytes combination. And uh, fully agree. Based on the silicon material, that's uh, maybe the first step, uh, step up. And then maybe that could be like lithium metal. And after lithium metal, maybe we might have uh, anode rest, really complete anode rest. Maybe the lithium coming from electrolyte material. That's uh, maybe it's a kind of uh, evolution. I allow one more question from the audience before lunch. Here we have okay, Silvia, if I can, please. Thank you, Silvia Bodardo from Polytechnic of Torino. Thank you very much for your very clear presentation. My question is more on production. Now we have uh, these uh, so many gigafactories that are going to be set. In the case of uh, moving from uh, lithium ion to solid state, do you feel that we reuse the technology? Do you feel that we have to get new factories producing or readapt? What uh, is your feeling in the future by production? Uh I don't think that we will uh, adapt any factory that was built for liquid electrolyte lithium-ion batteries uh, to solid uh, state batteries. Um, because as I, as I showed on my uh, first slide, the market is increasing so rapidly. So there will be new factories that, uh, that will produce SSB. And the processes, uh, I mean, it depends a bit on the technology, but they, they will be quite a bit different. So there will be different steps in there. Um, in, in the production of solid state batteries. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, that's a, that's a challenge um, for, uh, for the producers. That, that's why we also think it will, it will take some time until they really gain uh, higher market shares. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to answer? M maybe a small uh, comment on that. I think maybe uh, the full gigafactory will not be reused, but I think what is important when you set up a solid state battery factory in the future is to, as much as possible, try to reuse the same type of equipment, the same type of process which I use today, because you cannot change everything and it will be too costly. So as much as possible, we should try to reuse the same process and f uh, equipment. I think that's a, a key uh, aspect. Well, yes and no, uh, because I think um, <laughs> it is also, since, since we need to build new factories for them, uh, I think it's also a chance to directly move to better processes, to greener processes that need less energy. Um, so if that would be possible, I, I think that would be actually the, the better approach. Um, 
So to move to um, uh, to extrusion processes directly, for example, um, which for the polymer SSB uh, is already done. Uh, then, then you don't need um, to to dry your your uh, cathode material after coating it. So it's. Uh, you can save a lot of energy with that, so I, th I think it would be good to, to think this uh, already um, ahead as well. I mean, if possible. Of course, <laughs> it will be initially more expensive, uh, I agree, but uh, in the long term it might be, it might be better. It's and nice to uh, have yeah. a little bit yes. of different aspects. Yes, I'd like to one comment, because uh, it, the current uh, liquid based on the German battery, we are using a slurry basis, wet chemistry. But uh, if you look at the solid state battery, we might adapt like a dry process. That's a completely different way of thinking. So maybe uh, in the coming years, already Tesla already mentioned, uh, based on the dry process, that may be good to dry, but to further reduce the cost. OK, I have now a final question to each of you. This morning, you heard that we had we a number of initiatives collaborating now to ha harmonize the message. So uh, we speak with a clear voice despite having different sort of uh, roles in this. And what are you expecting and hope that these initiatives can bring to you and, and, uh, and really be helpful for you? And uh, in what aspect? Who would like to start? <laughs> I think as a SME, indeed, um, it's very important, again, to be as much as possible involved with larger companies, um, alliance or receiving or testing material from larger company. I'm thinking, for example, cathode material for us is very important to be able to demonstrate that the material we are developing is really a line, or at least there are some material available at the cathode sites which are compatible with our material. This is a key aspect, and that we are working on already uh, today. So collaborate with this collaborate. European Battery Alliance. Yeah, about 250 is perfect then, yeah. Um, yeah, for, for us it's a little bit different because I'm, I'm coming from a, a Fraunhofer Institute that is actually not doing um, applied research in the sense that we don't have labs ourselves, so at least our institute, there are other institutes as well. But um, so for, for us the networking is actually very important, so talking to, to people from, from uh, small companies, from big companies, from research, from the European Union, um, and um, yeah, get an idea about the big picture and how to connect uh, the, the little puzzle pieces. Because we are generally looking also from an eagle's eye perspective on, on things and try to understand the, the whole system and try to support that, of course, um, with, mm. with our studies and our insights. Yeah. Sounds good. We are all needed in our initiatives. That's good. And for you, Mikor, what would you dream of having? Actually, uh, you already made the announcement of the collaboration with Volkswagen and ACC. That's the collaboration is very important. First, you need to talk to an OEM and really understand what they need, when, by when. That's very important. Otherwise, we can't develop the material. That's why further collaboration with the OEM and also different material suppliers is very important. Maybe we might collaborate with the uh, survey because we have a part of an initiative. So that's very important to really, uh, collaborate with the vertical and the horizontal. That's very important. I thought you would also say, we need the academic to give you competences, <laughs> skilled people. We are competing about it, aren't we? Valerie, you will have the last word of this uh, session. So what, uh, what yes. are you hoping? <laughs> yes, thank you. So I think uh, I already emphasized this uh, several times, that the collaboration in the ecosystem is very important. We have already some, I would say, collaboration in place and some funding support from the Europe, which is very important. That sounded plenty quite... Of, <laughs> plenty of room in uh, applied research and I would say bringing the innovation to large scale. So inventing new processes, sustainable processes, uh, make it happen at, uh, I would say, size of scale is, uh, is a great challenge and a good opportunity. Okay, with this I, I thank all of our panel members for all your contributions in this <laughs> hot room. Thank you very much. I also thank everyone online. Thank you for joining and asking really good questions in the chat. I wish I, we had time to answer more of them. And for you here being so very pay, patient, it's so hot in this room, and we all deserve lunch now. So thank you.